So, what, what I'll talk today about is, is give you an idea of, of how land and food, and if we're going to grow food in a working biome, how we're going to provide the fertility for that food. And the way to do that, we're going to talk about the movement a little bit, we're going to talk about scale, because when we talk about feeding the country, it's, it's a big deal. And, and I'm going to talk about our diet a little bit, because we need to know what kind of diet we're going to have to grow food for. And then, and then we're going to talk about the United States. We're not going to talk about the world, we're not going to talk about California, but because the United States is, is a, a size that's easy to discuss. Okay? Um, we're going to talk about stuff that's organic versus stock free, what, what that means, and it's going to be a little controversial. And then we, if I get to it, it'll be about impacts, like how, how kind of resistance there's out there and how you might see this work. So the movement there is in veganic, there is no such thing as veganic agriculture. We're going to use that term because we're all familiar with it, but there is a certification for stock free organic out of the UK. So, so that's right there. You, you, can, you can buy products that are stock free, and there's a, like an organization that will come out and certify you. There's also a new certification up over here by the American Vegetarian Association for vegan farms. Okay, it's not stock free organic, it's none of that, it's called vegan farms. I try to get information about that, but I can't, I can't get them to respond with some of the details. It's not that important. The veganic world, though, is being led by Studies on the farms and like one degree bread. They're, they're amazing organizations that have claimed the term veganic. You go down the street, you can buy veganic bread. It'll tell you, food grown without any stock inputs, any, any animal inputs. It's, it's amazing to see that. And it's, it's in all the stores, right? But, but the rest of the veganic movement is, is like the veganic agricultural network, which is a, is a web based network of people who support each other. You've got books on veganic agriculture from growing, from growing green. And uh, even John Jevons, all his work is actually began, but he doesn't actually say it, it's all plant based. And then you have tons of small farms, real small farms that have CSAs and, and other organizations like NAVs that are promoting. You'll go to lots of websites and we'll talk about you know, no animals in agriculture. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a nice, broad based, sort of chaotic and undefined world right now. Imagine organic 40 years ago when people were, what does what organic mean? And it's the same kind of state right now. And then, and then you have people like Bob Comas, who's actually a farmer who has quit just like Howard Lyman, and he's, gonna, he's putting out a movie now on how to, how to go vegan. Okay, so, so that's the movie. It, it's, there really isn't any real movement here, and we'll, we'll talk about scale. So, so, so if we envision this world where tomorrow we're, we're going we're gonna to focus on removing all the domesticated animals from, from, from the United States, and not Alaska, we're not talking about Alaska because uh, because they have a lot of land, very few people, and it skews the statistics. And we're not going to talk about pet food or anything like that either. We're just going to talk about agriculture for human consumption versus animal agriculture. So if tomorrow we were taking all, in, all these animals off, we would have 612 million acres of pasture land that would suddenly be rewilded. So in conspiracy, we'll talk, we'll, we'll talk, we'll talk about how the world can just be restore all this land to the wild? It's absolutely correct, 100%. 612 million acres tomorrow. In addition, there's 127 million acres of forest land that's grazed. All of that will be totally rewilded. We made all the cows, all the wild horses will be back. It's just, just imagine that, okay? And don't imagine it from a perspective of, well, we'll, we'll be, that'll be Montana and Colorado and Wyoming. Imagine it from a perspective of what animal agriculture really is. It's, it's ubiquitous. It's, it's in every corner, every county in the country, just about. It's, it's back east, it's down south, you know, on the northern plains. It's everywhere. And so you'd have all of that kind of fading away. So all of that land would be rewilded. It wouldn't just be the western grasslands. It would be northeastern hardwood forests. So, so you wouldn't see it. You would just see that the world differently, almost like the world would have been, you know, 100 or 150 years ago. And in addition to that pasture land and forest land that's raised, we have cultivated land. And that's what I'm going to focus on. So we have 408 million acres of land in this country that's termed cultivated, whether it's no-till agriculture or, or any other form of agriculture. It's in some way cultivated to form a working biome to feed us. And unfortunately, we know that most of, most of that is in corn, soybeans, hay, and sorghum 
And you can see that out of the 60 or 230 million acres of land that's cultivated, is cultivated to feed animals. And then you get down here to wheat, rice, other grains, fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables are only 12 million acres in this country. This is not a lot of land compared to the other land that's cultivated. In addition, when you look about organic, I'm going to bring this along here just so we kind of start thinking about that. There's a million acres of organic vegetables in the country. That's all. That's all there is. All the food that you see in all the stores here amounts to only about a million acres of organic land. Okay. Now, when we talk about this some more, we're going to we have to think about exports. Let's think about exports and imports. Because even though we're going to try to talk about the United States, we have to kind of consider how do, how do we bring food in here? So, imports, we're bringing in olive oil and seasonal fruits and, and spices and all kinds of different products that we're exporting. What are we exporting? We're exporting a lot of that meat and, and some of the animal food as well as some of the animal products themselves. But when you look at it, you see that there's, there's not that much of a difference between exports and imports. They're different products. But the, but the economic importance of it is, is somewhat similar, so I'm going to eliminate that as well. Again, so we're just going to focus on, on human food. We're not going to talk about cotton and these other things that are cultivated that has to be produced, but, but let's, just, let's just talk about food. So, so where do we get graphs like this? Where, where do you get this kind of information? It turns out that the USDA, that supports all this animal agriculture, also independently just reports the food that's grown in every county in the country. It's just part of the process. The National Agricultural Statistical Service is a huge organization, and every three years they come out reports. And those reports are just factual assessments of this is how much food was produced. And there's other organizations like the EPA, the Department of Energy, we're looking at carbon footprints and things like that. Just a major amounts of university factories, publications, like resources. There's so much information out there in agriculture. It's, it's, it's incredible. There's also the peer reviewed journals and, and great literature, and the great literature is stuff that is produced by very knowledgeable people, but, but perhaps not independently peer reviewed. Okay? And then there's the advocacy websites. Not all advocacy websites have a, a, a twisted mission. You, you can go to the poultry's you know, propo you know, proponents and, and you get good information on what goes into their production. Um, and it's good information to use because it's probably biased in. in benefit of animal agriculture, so if you use that to, to criticize it, you, you get a, a kind of a good balance there, okay? So, we have to feed everybody now, right? We, there's no more animals left, we have to feed everybody. How much food do we need in this country? So if you go to the Health and Human Services, you will get recommendations of caloric intake for different ages of the population. Now, this is Pretty good information. It's not exact. Everybody's going to be a little bit different. Some people need a little more, a little bit less, mostly too much, but, 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 but varies. This is for active people. There's different age groups, and for men and women, it's a little different. So you have to look at the age group that they look at it, the different caloric intakes, and you have to massage the census data for the 325 or so million people in the country, and you have to figure out that where do they fit into that caloric need. Again, this is all theoretical, but what you come out with is if we were going to feed everyone in this country for one year, we need 277 trillion calories of food. The scale of that is hard, it's hard to comprehend. But, you, but agriculture is ubiquitous across the country. We've got the 408 million acres to work with. And to do that, we need, to, to get these 277 trillion, we're going to have to, to create a diet. Now, it comes out to be that the average that is 2,362 calories per person. That's what we got to come up with. Again, no pets involved here. And how do we come up with what we're going to feed? Now, in, in the reality, in a, in a world that transitions slowly, the, the, the farmers will respond to demand. So if there's more demand for one product, the farmers will slowly start growing more of that. And, and if there's less demand for one thing, they'll fight it, they'll, they'll, they'll resist, but, but they'll eventually grow what people want to eat. So, so all of the efforts by everybody in this room to, to convert to a vegan diet will, will shift it, the whole landscape of agriculture. In, in, in the direction that we really don't quite know, okay? But if we were to feed everyone tempeh sandwiches tomorrow instead of meat, just use meat alternatives, which are a lot of here today, we don't have to change anything. We have all the vegetables we've already consumed, and if people just were to take their hamburgers and, and eat veggie burgers, we have all the wheat and all the soy and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's all being produced. We would have more than enough. But that's not how I look at it. So, you know, coming out of Lord's talk, you know, food empowerment, healthy food for everybody, 
we need available food, accessible food, we need a healthy diet. So who do you go for a healthy diet? You go to guys like Neil Bernard and actually Erica Meyer. So Alexis Fox and Michael Rizzo have this new website out called Ladder.world and they, they promote a healthy diet. You can go there and you can dial in and figure out what's going to work for you. You get recipes and it's supposed to be a, a diet that is, is going to be healthful, right? Simplest terms. And so what do they eat? They eat this, kind of. So if you look at vegetables down here, you'll see that the caloric density of those vegetables is really low. For one ounce of broccoli, it's only 10 calories, okay? And for one ounce of tempeh, it's 54. So the, the mix in any given day is going to be these foods with other foods that, that are not here. But they represent a nice cross-section by which we can assess how the world will look with, with vegan agriculture. So what I did is I looked at a, a number of vegetables here and a number of fruits. I looked at apples and, and cherries and blueberries and, and you can see the caloric context a little higher for an ounce because it's got more sugars in it. As you work your way up to the, to the beans, and you get more substance, they have seeds and, and nuts. And, and so we, we take a cross section of those and we come up with our 2,362. But actually this diet is only 2,359. And the reason is, is that my wife doesn't start her diet in the morning without that three calories of coffee. <laughs> and that's the only product that's doing really, it that's not going to be grown in the United States, but we throw that just to mix the balance out the number. Okay, so let's look at those products now. Let's just take individual ones. And potatoes is a good one because we're all familiar with potatoes. And uh, potatoes are grown in many parts of the country. You can see all the different states that grow potatoes. These are all from the statistics that are put out by the USDA. And if we take that idea of 277 trillion calories in our percentage based on that model diet that can fluctuate a lot in any direction, we're about 7%, 8% of our diet has to come from potatoes. It's the cake. We expand that across, we find out that we're going to need 25.6 million tons of potatoes to feed the country for a year. And if we don't put it all into potato chips and french fries, we'll actually be a pretty healthy diet, right? So, right now, we have about 22 million tons of potatoes being produced. And if you look at average yields from across all these different states, you'll find out that in the future, we're going to need about 1.2 billion acres of potatoes to feed the country. Okay, put it in there, cash it up, put it in the table. Now, I'm going to talk about nitrogen for a second. I'm going to carry it through and then we're going to get into it in detail later. We need about 200 pounds of nitrogen for an acre of potatoes. Just don't think much more about that. So then we get to our vegetables. And this is, these are great vegetables to consider the crucifers, the brassicas, the mustard family. And we'll look at broccoli. But broccoli just represents all these vegetables. So someone might say, wait a minute, what about the kale? Well, the kale is included. So we're going to need broccoli and kale and cauliflower and all these different vegetables. But we're going to use broccoli as the surrogate for that. And we'll figure out how much we, can, we need to grow. And that will include all these different vegetables. So broccoli, as a, because this low caloric density, high nutritional value, is going to be about 2.5 percent of our calories. You work that across. We currently grow about 970,000 tons, so we're going to need 22 million tons. Now this is just broccoli. So that 22 million tons refers to broccoli, the kale, the cabbage, and all these other things that we grow more of. And so for the brassicas, we're going to need about 2.8 million acres. No problem. They take about 150 to 800 pounds of nitrogen. They just kind of think about that. All right. So now we go into the fruits. And these, I picked, I picked these ones because they give us an idea of agriculture that we're not, that, from, that most people are not that familiar with. So up in Washington, they grow the most apples, and then New York is the next. And if you look at New York and Washington, they have actually less bearing acres of apples than they had in the past, but they have more productivity, higher yields. And the reason for that is that agriculturists around the country, around the world, have changed the system. So this is an apple orchard from the past. You have individual trees 15 to 20 feet apart, a nice open canopy, and the ones in the future are fruiting walls of apples. So if you if you work in this world and you and you're supporting farmers to be a more profitable and more high yielding 
enterprises, you'll find that you're focusing on trying to achieve 75 tons of apples per acre. Right now, the best are at about 18 to 20 tons. Some guys in the research have maybe even uh, put out 40 tons an acre. But theoretically, they're moving toward that. And that means better light intersection, you know, just better ways of growing things. And so that's happening in all these crops. There's our research working across the country to try to improve the way they grow so they can increase yields, improve nutritional value, and get more, more crop out of each individual land. Apples take, I don't have it here, apples take about 100 tons of nitrogen per acre. But as these yields go up, it will take more. Okay? So, we take apples, we look at about 3% of our calories. This is just apples, because I have cherries separate and I have peaches because I just love food. And so, so, we need about 18 million tons of apples. We are already doing about 4.6. We're going to need you know, 1.3 million acres of apple trees in this country, which is totally achievable. Um, but that's, that's assuming this model we're creating here, okay? And let's go to mushrooms. And this, I put some mushrooms, everybody loves the mushrooms, they're their nutritional uh, food. And there's a difference about mushrooms, and they, and they represent a different part of agriculture. So, 10, ten years or so ago, a guy named Michael Bomford, he was at the University of Kentucky, he's now a fellow from the Post Carbon Institute, did an assessment of, of what was the the carbon footprint of lettuce grown in Kentucky in the winter versus shipping it into Mexico. That's a nice thing to do, right? One of the first studies that did that. So you take you take a greenhouse and you figure out all the embodied energy in all the greenhouse, and you figure out how much energy you need to to, to, to heat it and to cool it and to you know, operate the greenhouse, and, and then all that goes with growing the lettuce. And then you say, well, how much energy did that all take if you went to Mexico and just brought it up here? And it came out to be the same. Okay? So these life cycle analysis that are analyses that are that are have taken off tremendously in the last 10 years often give you results that don't seem intuitive. You would think, well, it's local, so it must be better. But it's not, because there, there are other factors to consider. So he said, well, if it's the same, let's grow it in Kentucky. Then the farmers will benefit at least, right? There's no difference. But if you take that same concept and you and you move it to Colorado, where the winters are colder, so you need more heat, but you're closer to Mexico, suddenly that equation would say, ship it in from Mexico. We're not shipping on this, we're not doing imports, but you can see how this life cycle analysis makes a difference in how you assess the foods you need. And that's, and that's, what's, that's where the future of agriculture is going. You don't just say, it's be, this is better, you have, to, you have to know if it truly is better. And so, mushrooms are an example of that. They're, uh, they're grown in high intensity uh, structures where they grow many, many crops in a single given year. We're not talking about the inputs that they grow out of, but, but the idea that mushrooms um, are different than, let's say, apples. And if you look at that farm we talked about, the, the first vegan farm in Philadelphia, it's all indoors in a warehouse. It's, it's a vertical farming organization, and they produce lots of vegetables for the local restaurants in the area, and they do it all in Philadelphia year-round. So it's, it's not clear whether their carbon footprint is lower than bringing it in from elsewhere, but, but the, the technology they're using is getting it closer and closer and closer so that you can grow things in controlled environments almost as efficiently as you can grow them outdoors. Another example is here, this is in Hodgkins, Colorado, where we're putting up tunnels to grow cherries outdoors. And there's a variety of reasons why it's important to do that because of the climate there, but it's, it's being worked out, we're trying to figure out if it's, if it's actually environmentally sound to do this. So when you look at mushrooms, we're going to see, we're going to see about 1% of our calories from mushrooms. We're going to need to increase the 630 acres to 30,000 acres of mushroom houses. It's all achievable, of course, but it is an idea of, of a lot of agriculture is going in this direction. Okay? So, so where does this come out? What happens with this? We take these numbers, we put on this graph, we add them all up, and not to go over every one of these crops. And if you know, mushrooms doesn't even 30,000 acres doesn't even show up on the graph. And it turns out that we need 101 million acres of land in this country to grow all the crops we need for that wonderful diet where everyone will have to be healthy. It's a far cry from 408 million acres currently used. All right, now, that's not the whole story. We have to think about getting fertility into those acres, okay? So, 
We're going to focus on that nitrogen. NPK is the most important nutrient. That's not the most important, but it's the one that's required in the greatest quantity of these, of these elements. And we're going to look at that and see, see how we can provide that. We can look at all. We can look at phosphorus and potassium. We can look at you know, all these different elements that are all essential for growing plants. These are all mines. Every one of these has to be mined from either biological extraction from the soil or from just digging it out and chemical removal from the soils. But we'll look at nitrogen because it's, it's got unique properties in that we can get it out of the atmosphere. And in, in organic systems, we use a, a relationship with nitrogen fixating plants, or actually the bacteria that are associated with nodules on the roots of, of bean plants, okay? And that nitrogen can then be fixed and stored in the soil or in the plant tissue itself. And it goes through a process of nitrification and denitrification. We don't need to get too involved in it. But in the end, the plants can take it up. So in, in organic systems, for the, the organic or veganic, people use a component of cover cropping to grow the fertility they need for the crops they're growing. So you can imagine if we have 101 million acres, let's break it down to one acre. If you're growing one acre of broccoli, you, you could have another acre sitting next to it with cover crops on it that are fixing nitrogen from the atmosphere, sequestering it into that soil, and then the next year you can take your broccoli from this side and move it over there and grow it in that soil and then switch back and forth. Now that's a simplified rotation. There are much more complex rotations where you substitute crop after crop, and you can, you can improve the fertility of the soil, okay? So, it turns out that the, the nitrogen productivity of any given acre of land using this method, if you are not going to till it in, but actually extract it and move it somewhere else, is about 200 pounds an acre. If you grow an acre of soybeans and you take make soybean meal, you will get about 200 pounds of nitrogen out of it. If you grow an acre of alfalfa, get four cuttings, and take all that biomass and grind it up and put it into your broccoli field, you'll get about 200 pounds of nitrogen. And so, to, to, to figure out how we're going to maintain that fertility in this working biome, we need to double it by two. Okay, so we went from 101 million acres of land that we now need 202 million acres of land to grow all the food we need. So it's, you said, so it's 101 million of active, like, crop production, cash crop, rest is covered, rest is covered, compost, right now. At, at most, we can get it by with less, but these are what you look at it from at most, okay? And that means that of that 408 million acres of, of cropped land, cultivated land in this country, you can, get, you can return another 205 million acres of it to wildland. We wild it all. We don't need it. Not for the 325 million people. So, back in 1945, 1940-ish, Sir Albert Howard, I think it was in the 40s, I think it was in the 30s, he's, he's the father of organic agriculture. Okay? He, he, he'd been growing things organically for millennia. You know, go back to you know, 5,000, 10,000 years, it's all been grown organically, of course. But he's the one who kind of wrote about it and kind of you know, got us all to realize that we would call it organic agriculture as compared to conventional agriculture. Conventional agriculture started at the turn of the century when these two guys right here, Abert Bosch, invented this process, the Abert Bosch process, to make nitrogen from the atmosphere using natural gas as a feedstock. We need it as part of the process. So you, can, you don't need organic stuff. You can just get nitrogen out of the air, you can just make a bag of fertilizer and add it to your crops. And around the 1940s, 1947 actually, it was one of the first reports by the Federal the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, just a two-year-old organization. We were following up the war, which was, it just devastated the planet. And they said, we need to feed these people. And they came up with the idea that we're going to have to export like 38, 40 million tons of food to Europe and Asia, otherwise there's going to be famine, and mass die-offs of people because we can't feed all of them. But surprisingly, even back then, they said that we're also growing the population of 15 to 20 million people a year. And the only way we can feed those people is not through an organic method, but through these conventional methods, because we can get immediate sustained expansion of production. And if we're going to try to feed people who are going to be starving to death, let's go this way. And that's when fertilizer became the ubiquitous source of fertility for all of agriculture in this country.
There's only one million acres of organic vegetables, don't forget. There are 407 million acres of tilled land using conventional agriculture. Uh, <clears throat> so, we're all tuned into the factory farming. We all understand that. Current organic agriculture is almost exclusively dependent on factory farms. And so I've taken an example here of an egg-laying facility. Margin Beach just talked about that. They take these chickens when they're done and they're no value to the industry. And they just dispose of their bodies. Okay? It makes this calculation really easy because if there's not another byproduct, you don't have to assess where that byproduct is. What they do do is they take all of these piles of chicken manure, they call it chicken litter, and it's one of the one of the most sought after uses of source after sources of nitrogen in the organic vegetable industry. That's what they use. They use chicken litter to augment the nitrogen. Because the cover cropping works well, but it's, it doesn't always work that well. And if you're a farmer, you're trying to get maximum yields with minimum inputs, you're not going to take two acres of land and use one of them to cover crop, you can get chicken litter, and now you can grow all your vegetables on both acres of land. So instead of building your fertility locally, you import your fertility. So it's happened that it's all that million acres of vegetables, almost all of it uses chicken litter or also some other forest source of chicken or animal products. And it could be feathers and blood and bone and other products, or it could be fish. Because we go, we raise all the fish and you can buy drums and drums of liquefied fish to put on your crops as well. Okay. So let's think about, I'm going to try to transition now. How do we assess? The, the impact of all of, all of this. How do we assess that? And, and, the, and the best way, because everyone is kind of tuned into it, is we look at the carbon footprint of what it takes to produce this chicken litter. Okay? That's easy to do. I, I, I think it's been done many, many times. What I'm going to try to do is assess the carbon footprint of that chicken litter, but from the perspective of the nitrogen in that chicken litter, in a uniform amount, one pound of nitrogen, how much of a carbon footprint and CO2 equivalent does one pound of that nitrogen from that chicken litter provide fertility for crop production? And it turns out, and I'm pretty confident with this number, that it's 21.4 kilograms of CO2 equivalent for one pound of nitrogen. That's, that's, a, lot, that's, a, lot, that's a lot of work for that number right there. <laughs> Soybean meal, if it was grown in, a, in, in land equivalent to this, just somewhere else, just grow soybean meal, that's about 200 pounds an acre. The carbon footprint of that soybean meal would only be 1.6 kilograms of carbon. A huge difference. So when people say that a factory farm is wasteful, it's wasteful in, in, in every aspect. And, and there it is, right then and there alone, you can see the difference. The nitrogen from, from a chicken house, even though it's free and considered a waste product, the carbon footprint associated with that is gigantic compared to the carbon footprint of just, just put some soy on the side and grow soybean. We grow tons of soybeans anyway. Don't feed it the chickens, put it in the soil. And this provides lots of benefits other than just the nitrogen. We're not going to get into it because it would just be too complex. If you use the Haber-Bosch method and said, I'm not going to use any of this stuff, I'm just going to get the Haber-Bosch nitrogen in the bag at the, at the feed store, it's only 1.5 kilograms. It has less of a carbon footprint than soybean meal. And that's because the technology that has gone into making fertilizer, despite what you may have heard, is actually becoming more and more efficient. And the EU has put out a tremendous amount of information about this process because they're trying to assess their carbon footprint, and that's one of the big ones. And so the technology has made it much more efficient. Now that's a range, that's an average. Some of them not or even less. Some, some individual factories have gotten that production of nitrogen down to 1.1 kilograms of CO2 output. So it's, it's, it's quite dry. Now, this is not sustainable. This is coming from uh, the mine gas out of gas fields, but it could come from biogases as well. All right, so it also does not provide any of the other phosphorus or potassium or anything else. So it's, it's not a, a, a solution to the agriculture like we, we have thought it's been because of our problems with it, but it's still a much better source of nitrogen 
than chicken liver. Okay? So to be honest, this is where, where most, most work kind of falls apart. We can stop right then there and I can say, well, it's 21.4 kilograms of CO2, but that's not being honest, and that's where the meat industry only stops. It's, you see life cycle analysis, and they'll say, well, you know, chicken is, is better, but they just draw a line somewhere that's arbitrary, and then they don't f tr trace it all the way out to get all of the inputs that go with things. So we are going to get, with that chicken litter, we're going to get 170 eggs out of that. So I calculated what, well, how much chicken litter is the results from the production of eggs, and at the end we get uh, 170 large eggs, 60 gram eggs. And that's 15,901 calories. So we have to account for that. We can't say, well, we're not going to use chicken, but, 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 but we're not. In our world here, we don't have chickens to use. We got to account for another 16,000 calories, and we can do that with potatoes, or we can do it with more 10 day sandwiches. Let's just make it easy, more meat alternatives. So the carbon footprint of those 38 pounds of potatoes or those tempeh sandwiches is about 4.15, let's take the worst case, 4.15 kilograms of CO2, add that to the 1.69, we get about you know, 7 kilograms of CO2 if we use soybean meal and eat tempeh sandwiches compared to having eggs from a chicken factory. So it's three times more, less carbon intensive. So, I say, let's consider that synthetic nitrogen. Here's another thing about synthetic nitrogen. If we, if we then, if we step back and we say, <coughs> I don't want to grow soybean, I want to, I want to make money, I want to, I want to be profitable on the smallest amount of land that I can be profitable on, and that means I'm going to have to bring in all my fertility, and I'm going to do that using the Haber-Bosch method. And if I do that. And, I, and I'm going to crop just that 101 million acres of land. I'm going to need 9 million plus tons, metric tons, of nitrogen to do that. Based on all the different vegetables we're going to grow. It's a lot of that, it's a lot of nitrogen. And the equivalent of the CO2 output, the CO2 footprint of that nitrogen is now, now we're serious here. We're not talking you know, 21 kilograms, you know, we're talking 30 million tons of CO2 equivalent output. Okay? But that's over 101 million acres because, because we've taken that under 101 million acres that we were going to use for fertility and what are we going to do with that? Well, let's see. Well, let, let, let me back up a second. We're, we've got this 101 million acres and we're going to get all of our nitrogen from the Haber-Bosch method. We're not going to talk about the phosphorus and the potassium. We're just going to talk about the nitrogen. And that's our input. So our carbon footprint of that nitrogen is, is about 0.3 tons of CO2 per acre. Okay? But the benefit we get from that is that we can then release that other 101 million acres that we can held back so we can build our fertility, and we're going to rewild it into forests and mangrove grasses. And the amount of carbon sequestered from those forests and grasses will be between 2.2 and 9.5 tons of CO2 per acre. So, when you hear about people talking about conventional agriculture as a better way to go, they're, 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 not, they're making a case that can be justified to some degree. Because if you return that 101 million acres, but they're not doing that, they're not returning that 101 million acres back up to the forest, but if you did, you would sequester more carbon than we would ever use using the Hebrew Bosch process, at least in the short term. In a world where we need to sequester carbon as quickly as we possibly can, this is a potential alternative. Now, <clears throat> I'm not an advocate of using only synthetic fertilizers, but in, my, in the work I've done in the last three years, I've come to accept the fact that there are situations in agricultural practices where using synthetic fertilizer is actually better for the environment in a number of ways. So if you take you take peach trees or apple trees and you try to time the amount of nitrogen that they need, that they need for, for fruit production, there are critical periods during the growing season when nitrogen is very, very important. And if you're an organic grower, what they're doing is they're dumping as much chicken litter on the ground as they can because to get that nitrogen into the soil is difficult when you're not tilling it in. And the effect is you release a lot of that nitrogen to the atmosphere as nitrous oxides, and 
you don't get as much as you, you need more because you're not getting it into the soil. So conventional growers spray the nitrogen directly into the leaves. It's called canopy foliar application. The foliar application of the nutrients is highly effective and it can be timed nearly to the day that you need it. And so you can grow larger, better fruit by spraying nitrogen into, this, into the canopy of the plant. This is one example of it. And you're using about 80% of the nitrogen in that application versus much less when you're applying it to the ground. So there are times when using conventional nitrogen sources in conjunction with the more holistic practice of, of plant-based fertility in other systems is actually a very effective way to do things. And so in this world that I try to create over, over, over this idea of being totally together, um, I've come to the conclusion that using some nitrogen from synthetic sources is actually better for the environment. Okay? Now, we have time, so I'm going to talk about what will happen now if, if, we, if we see this, how, what's it going to look like, what's it going to look like, what's where are the impacts. So we have California, you guys are all Californians, I'm sure, but are familiar with the state. This whole valley is highly productive agriculturally, and right now we have 8 million acres of cropland in California, and you've got 8 million acres, of, almost 8 million acres of irrigated land. This is 2012, so it doesn't account for the drought in the last few years. You have, you have a tremendous amount of irrigated land, and you only have about five and a half million acres of those used for vegetables. The rest is used to grow food for these individuals here. You have eight million eight cows in California, it seems ridiculous, okay? You know, 300 million chickens in California, it doesn't seem right, but you know that when you drive south into Fresno and Cairn County and Tulare counties, the three richest agricultural counties in the United States, just south of here. They have tremendous amounts of animal agriculture there. Every acre of these, of these counties that can be irrigated can be irrigated and grow vegetables. And in California, unlike most states, all the systems are in place for growing those vegetables. We have, we have the processing facilities, we have the, the harvesting facilities, we have the, the storage facilities here in the state ready to go. You can expand them easily because Large ag is already growing 30% of the vegetables here in California. So you can imagine California, which leads the country in all kinds of different things, could lead the way in vegan or stock-free agriculture. It would be very hard to call. You can also go to a place like this. This is where I'm from, in Grand Junction, Colorado. So you have the Rocky Mountains here. You can't bring crops in there. That's all the pasture land. That would be wild here. But in this little valley here, the Colorado River runs right through here and drops down into Utah. And there's this little growing region. And there's also another one here in the Gunnison River Valley. And there's there's Hotchkiss, and this is a big fruit growing region. And there's also vegetables and other crops growing here. There's little pockets of, of, of good land and good climate for growing vegetables because it's isolated, it's very dry, very much like California, just a little bit colder. And a colleague of mine uh, who works with me there, he works on forest crops, so it's a constant constant friction between me and him, was out in Kansas and, and Nebraska just last week. And that's where big ag lives. That's where factory farming lives, and it's, it's, it's not going to budge. He was talking to those growers who grow thousands upon thousands, millions of acres of corn and soybeans, and said that you know, he's over here in Grand Junction, and he's got 32,000 acres of cropland, and, and they're growing alfalfa and hay out there. And they laughed at him because it doesn't make any sense. He said, you're out in Colorado in the Grand Valley. Why are you growing stuff for feed cows? Why are the, the big ag guy said, why aren't you growing vegetables? Because that's what we grow well here. So it's not me saying, hey, we should grow vegetables here. What they're saying is, if you want to grow more vegetables, pick these kinds of places because you can grow a lot of vegetables there. And so you can imagine that in the future is, as demand for vegetables goes up, these farmers aren't going to grow hay and alfalfa anymore. They're going to start growing vegetables in places like this. So again, you're going to see a dispersed change in agriculture over time if the demand goes up. And, and that's an important thing. So you know, this is a, a fairly tight audience here, and, 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 and it should be that way because the movement that we're, that we're involved in is a
a cultural movement right now, it's a social movement to try to change the demand for food in this country. You don't really need to get involved in the agricultural piece of it so much because it's so tiny. It's just the, the influence of, of changing to one, one more vegan doesn't really have an effect on how much food they stock at Whole Foods. It but, but, it, but as that demand grows, then this will start to change, okay? And it, so the people who, who flock to hear Howard and Will and, and Rich Openland and, 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 and Lawrence, it's, it's where you need to hear. You need to be inspired to get more people to go vegan because that demand will slowly and carefully shift. We're not going to have what I suspect. Like, we're, we're not going to have everyone just going to go vegan tomorrow. We're going to have all this land to play with. It's going to be a slow process. The unfortunate part about it is that or, well, this is a small group thinking about this, just trying to think visionary how it will look. On the, in, on the, on the other side of this wall, where, where Big Ag is, they, they have massed all of their resources against this. They're not fighting the cultural part so much. They're fighting the cultural part from the agricultural end of things. And, and, and those resources are so enormous that it's, it's hard for anyone to even comprehend it. Okay? In, in California, we have three land grant colleges. We have Berkeley, UC Davis, and Riverside. And, and those, those were established to support agriculture in California and disseminate information on agriculture across California. So if you have a, a, a professor in ecology at Berkeley who is railing against climate change and we need to stop animal agriculture, you have extension agents and agriculturists from that same university who are saying, let's get more meat on the table. Because they, not because that's where the money is, it's because that's the, what they want, that's their culture. It's entrenched and they want more of it. Okay, so, so all the efforts to change culture are, are the most effective right now. And just be aware from this presentation that you don't have to worry. If you get everyone to go vegan next week, we'll be able to feed you. <laughs> okay, and we'll do that by, re by rewilding and addition all that pasture. We're going to rewild another 205 million acres of land. Okay? We're going to get all our fertility from plant-based sources and some synthesized sources that are very efficient. We're going to use high-density systems in the future. We're going to have lots of different kinds of forms of agriculture popping up that are higher density, higher productivity per square foot land. And then we'll have a healthy diet, not, not, not a tempting burger diet for everybody, but a healthy vegetable fruit-based diet for 325 million people. And then when I turn the slide off, we're going to have to realize that next year it's going to be 329 million people. Okay, that's all I got. So thanks for coming out.